What's up everyone? Next up we have Dust Clops and Dust Noir. Those who played Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald will remember Phoebe's two Dust Clops, whose pressure ability drained their PP away. Also, fans of Pokemon Mystery Dungeon 2 will recall Dust Noir as a terrifying villain. Today we'll see how Ghostly and Ghostlier fared in the competitive scene. So we ask, how good were Dust Clops and Dust Noir actually? And in this video, we'll be going over these competitive formats. Dusclops started out in OU in its debut generation as the tier's de facto rapid spin blocker, thanks to its bulk and lack of weaknesses to the spinner's other moves, meaning it was able to easily protect its team's spikes and thus making it an integral part of stall teams. However, Dusclops had some severe issues. It had to rely on the thoroughly unreliable pain split or the noticeably exploitable rest for recovery, and Dusclops was affected by both Sandstorm and Spikes, meaning it was incredibly easy to wear down. It's decidedly meager HP stat also somewhat offset its great defensive stats and it was slow to boot, making it tough to threaten much in return, especially since it didn't resist common physical moves like Rock Slide and Earthquake. All of these factors added up to a Pokemon that got overwhelmed extremely quickly when trying to take hits and do its job of blocking spin, and it didn't dish out any offense of its own either. Since Dusclops was so easy to break down, that made it easier to break through its team, and thus the early era of 386 play filled with Dusclops and Mega Stall teams drew to a close, especially as people realized they didn't need to block Rapid Spin to deal with Rapid Spinners, who had their own issues. The real nail in Dusclops' ghostly coffin, however, was the existence of Gengar, who was superior in every way despite its comparative lack of bulk. Here was a Pokemon that was able to stick around all game long thanks to its immunities to spikes and toxic. It was also immune to the most common physical move in the game. Earthquake, and had phenomenal speed, as well as being genuinely offensively threatening, making it more than just a rapid spin blocker. In fact, Gengar was so good that it took over and completely defined the metagame, meaning Dusclops was completely forgotten about. And also, the rise in pursuit Tyranitar to counter Gengar wasn't doing Dusclops any favors either. So, was there any hope for our one-eyed Spectre? Well, it did completely sit on rapid spin Claydol, who rose in prominence thanks to its spikes immunity and stabbed Psychic for Gengar. This isn't nearly enough to make it a metagame force, but it at least does still have a niche. It's just incredibly rare because it's brutally difficult to make a satisfactory team around Dusclops, given how severe its spike weaknesses is and how prominent spikes are in advance. And as such, Dusclops sits in Borderline. Dusclops evolved in Generation 4 and was the subject of much hype upon taking the form of Dust Noir. In fact, there was a lot to be excited about. Dust Noir had even better defensive stats, slightly higher HP, and a seemingly decent attack stat, in addition to gaining stab priority in the form of Shadow Sneak. But unfortunately, Dust Noir still had a host of overwhelming issues. Generation 4 brought a ton of offensive power creep with the boosting items Life Orb and Choice Specs, in addition to powerhouse moves such as Draco Meteor, to say nothing of strong new threats like Heatran and Infernape. Dust Noir's low HP meant that despite its massive defense and special defense, it was still not able to be the wall it wanted to be, which was bad news given how it lacked the speed and offensive prowess to do anything else. And Pursuit being physical now also meant Tyranitar was threatening it harder than ever from its significantly higher attack stat. And Dust Noir also faced competition with Spiritomb, whose secondary dark typing was a big boon in making it not weak to Dark itself, which was notable against not only Pursuit, but also Swords Dance Lucario's boosted crunch. And then Platinum came out, and along with it, the Rotom Appliances, who put both ghosts out of a job completely with their fully-fledged superiority, which was effectively similar bulk complemented by speed and an offensive prowess that meant it wasn't restricted to purely bulky sets. And most importantly, Levitate, meaning the Rotom Appliances had nearly infinitely more longevity via its immunity to spikes and toxic spikes, as well as Earthquake. Spiritomb at least retains some semblance of a niche given its ability to completely counter Machamp, but post-Platinum, no good player would be caught using Dust Noir in any halfway serious match. It was just so, so, so bad, terrible, and awful through and through. However, its usage never saw it drop to UU, so it actually languishes as one of the worst Generation 4 OUs amongst the likes of Electivire and Ninjas. Dust Noir's fall has been a cruel one, and had the generation continued on a little longer, it likely would have found new life in the lower tiers, but maybe not Yu thanks to the popularity of Spiritomb, Rotom, and Miss Magius, but surely NU at worst. But it couldn't even be given that. Even Heracross was Yu for a while. The Pokemon gods are mystifying at times. 
and for Gen 4 VGC. Dust Noir was able to parlay its remarkable bulk and ghost typing into a niche role in VGC play as a reliable trick room setter who could avoid any potential fakeouts from the opponent. Dust Noir saw respectable play in its very first VGC season in 2009, where sets typically consisted of some mix of the requisite trick room, along with support moves such as Will-O-Wisp and Psych-Up, and attacking moves such as Shadow Punch and Shadow Sneak. Quite a few Dust Noir users put up good results with variants of the Reaper, such as Smogan user Diesel's second place at the Seattle Regionals, with a team that paired Dust Noir with Endeavor Smeargle for a devastating opening turn salvo of attacks that set up for his Belly Drum Snorlax and Psych Up Smeargle to sweep. Fellow Smoganite Shu placed second in London with a Dust Noir that supported a squad of slow heavy hitters comprised of Camerupt, Abomasnow, and Lapras. But by far the most unique usage of Dust Noir came down to VGC veteran Huey Ha, who used an incredibly innovative team built by his frequent partner in crime, Makiri. This team, dubbed Fun Zone by its creator, paired Dust Noir with its usual compatriot, Smeargle, but in a very unexpected way. Smeargle's Dark Void was par for the course, but what was unexpected was its usage of Transform, not just to copy opponents, but to create double trouble with Machamp and Lapras that hit in the back. And why was that so devastating? Well, that part comes down to Dust Noir. See, this team holds the rare distinction of being both a Trick Room team and an anti-Trick Room team. Dust Noir carried both the vital move and Imprison, allowing it to set Trick Room against faster opponents and prohibit those using the strategy from setting it up. All of Huey's Pokemon were trained to have the same speed value of 76, meaning regardless of the speed of his opponent, he could almost always have the guarantee of moving first. Huey won San Francisco Regionals with this team, just one in his long resume of mind-boggling cool teams to put up a good performance. But unfortunately for Dust Noir, the 2010 metagame introduced its greatest competitor, Cresselia, who outclassed it as a trick room setter, both in offensive presence and support moves. With Cresselia out in the light, Dust Noir slunk back into the shadows, never to grace VGC again. Generation 5 saw the Rotom appliances lose their ghost typing, but nobody was even thinking about Dust Noir, thanks to the incredible new Pokemon, Jellicent. Dust Noir dropped out of OU with lightning speed, but it was a day late and a dollar short, as UU had Cofagrigus and Prankster Sableye. And so Dust Noir dropped further, landing in the new RU, but the three ghosts of Gen 4 UU's past, Spiritomb, Rotom, and Miss Magius, were also in the tier, as was the excellent new Golurk and those ghosts all severely outclassed Dust Noir, who provided nothing they couldn't do, while also doing more against the greater metagame, thanks to their increased resist, speed, or offensive weapons. And this time, Dust Noir wasn't given enough time to drop to NU, but it's doubtful it would have done well there either, given that Golurk resided there as well as Haunter and Mischievous. But interestingly enough, with the introduction of Eviolite, Dustclops became bulkier than its evolved counterpart. Now, the lack of leftovers was of course crippling for a Pokemon already famed for its issues with longevity, but it was so absurdly tanky against Pokemon like Heracross that a few especially dedicated UU stall teams found a place for it. And in fact, Dustclops was used enough to never drop to RU, meaning that a pre-evolved Pokemon resided in a higher tier than its evolved counterpart, and this is before Blissey wound up in Gen 6 UU. This unique distinction of sorts is at least some small consolation for the otherwise thoroughly forgettable Generation 5, this ghost duo had. And for Gen 5 VGC, although Dust Noir never came back to VGC, Eviolite also let Dustclops establish a foothold in the doubles format. The additional bulk of Eviolite facilitated the Skull Ghost family's main job, which is, of course, reliably setting up Trick Room. Eviolite meant that Dustclops reached insane levels of bulk, becoming virtually incapable of being knocked out in one turn and guaranteeing a Trick Room, bar the usage of taunt from an opponent. However, Dustclops didn't get a chance to shine in what might have been its best year 2011 due to the fact that it wasn't included in the Unova Pokedex. And by the time it was released from its shackles in 2012, its familiar competitor in Cresselia had returned as well, providing it with stiff competition. Nevertheless, while Dust Noir had been utterly outclassed by Cresselia, Eviolite boosted Dustclops was able to put together an argument for its use in some niche situations. Dustclops had a few tools to set itself apart from Cresselia, namely Will-O-Wisp to cripple physical attackers and Taunt to prevent other 
support mons from getting their job done. And while it lost some offensive prowess in its de-evolution, Nightshade still provided a source of reliable damage. Pain Split, meanwhile, was anything but reliable in its healing compared to Cresselia's option to run Moonlight. But it did have the niche benefit of telling you exactly what an opponent's HP was, a potentially crucial bit of info for specific calculations, especially when you factor Nightshade's set damage into account. While Dusclop saw some play in 2012, the bulk of its notable placements came in 2013. Nugget Bridge user Arulian7 placed 18th at the Athens Regionals, and the Korean player Ru Yun took top 4 in the Nintendo Korea Battle Cup with an unorthodox skill swap Dusclops. Dusclops also saw some top 4 placements in the Seniors metagame at both the Germany and the Australian Nationals. But perhaps its most intriguing usage came at the US Nationals via extreme veteran TJ. Seriously, he's been playing competitive since 1998 and helped run one of the first battle simulators ever. TJ used Dusclops to shore up Octillery with Moody and Water Spout, of all things. While TJ missed top cut by one game, this team exemplifies why Dusclops is useful for teams that absolutely need Trick Room to go off. Octillery needs Trick Room to fire off its full health Water Spout, and Dusclops' fake out immunity and extreme bulk make that situation far more likely to come about. Nevertheless, such niche uses were all Dusclops really amounted to in Gen 5, and it still remained a second tier pick in comparison to other Trick Room setters like Cresselia or Jellicent who provided the same ghost typing along with offensive pressure and a stellar ability. Now on to Gen 6. It should come as no surprise that Dust Noir was completely unable to keep up with the mega fueled increased power of the new generation. The buff knockoff was also a huge blow to a Pokemon who didn't need any help in the It Gets Worse department. It dropped like a stone through the tearing rung, flying past Aryu and Enyu, finally settling into the new lowest tier, PU. And there, Dust Noir was finally a genuinely decent Pokemon. It donned a life orb for the first time in the history of its evolution evolutionary line, and it got some terrific results. Sucker Punch and Shadow Sneak were excellent for threats such as Dodrio and fast psychics such as Mr. Mime and Kadabra. It was also able to check threats like Chatot and Monferno by being immune to one stab without fear of being blown up by their secondary stab thanks to the tier's generally low offensive stats. It generally was able to take a few hits from most offensive Pokemon like Zeb Stryka, Floatzel, and Sawsbuck. Being able to meaningfully trade blows with them was huge in easing the pressure on Dust Noir's teammates. Plus, Dust Noir was finally a good spin blocker. It took Cryogonal's hits well and was able to trap it as it fled with a powerful pursuit. It wasn't able to break through walls such as Bullaby, but it had a second set that could ruin them, which was the Choice Band set with Trick. Against offense, it got an even stronger priority move with no recoil to boot, while against defense, it could irremediably cripple a wall such as Tangela by not only taking away their precious defensive item, but by also giving them a straight jacket with Band. It wasn't a metagame crushing role, but Dust Noir was, at long last, a legitimate part of a tier. And as for Dusclops, it actually followed its evolution down to PU. Dusclops' utter reliance on its Eviolite meant it was even more deathly afraid of knockoff. But that aside, it was able to find a niche as a potentially threatening Calm Mind Sweeper. It was ridiculously passive due to being unable to dish out any immediate damage, which made it an easy switch for dangerous setup threats like Ninetales and Ursa Ring. And for this reason, Mischievous was preferred as a ghost type. But if one was looking to play the really, really long game, Dusclops could do well. And unfortunately for Dusclops, it missed out on the cut for a regional dex yet again, meaning it was relegated to the sidelines in 2014. And come 2015, it had to compete with, yeah, you guessed it, it had to compete with Cresselia. What's more, Aegislash was constantly muscling in on its ghost type slot, and the prevalence of Kangaskhan meant that if an opposing Kangaskhan didn't mega evolve, it could actually use Scrappy to remove Dusclops' defining advantage and fake out through its ghost type. Dusclops' lone champion was a name you might recognize from one of our recent videos, and I apologize if I butcher your name, Eugenio Discalzi, who used the exact same Dusclops plus Hariyama Trick Room team for most of the season, taking 4th place at the UK Regionals, 29th at Italy, and finally finishing out of top cut at Worlds. Now that's an arc that pretty much mirrors Dusclops' usage throughout the years. 
Now on to Sun and Moon. The above tiers were a foregone conclusion by this point, but cruelly enough, Dust Collapse's good times even all the way down in PU came to an end. Power Creep bumped everything down, meaning that Dust Noir's old nemesis of Spirit Tomb and Galurk now resided in the tier as well. And as we know by now, there is no reason to ever use Dust Noir when those two are around. They are simply more well-rounded, better Pokemon, thanks to their secondary typings, and in Golurk's case, a tremendous offensive move pull with a terrific attack stat and even stealth rock for support as such dust noir was relegated to the highest dishonor for a fully evolved pokemon that unusable limbo of untiered and funnily enough dust clots escaped this fate by virtue of not being fully evolved but it certainly didn't have any sort of pu niche either and now on to Gen 8. Yeah, I bet you didn't expect that. So most people who watch my channel know that I usually like to wait for a meta to develop before I talk about the new gen. But I know a lot of you are going to be asking for me to at least mention something about Sword and Shield for the Pokemon who are actually in Sword and Shield. So here it is. Dust Noir survived Generation 8's deck set, but hasn't been able to make its mark yet, since the lower tiers are not fully established at the time of this video. And OU is far too much for it, with superior ghosts aplenty running around, such as Dragapult, Age of Slash, Gengar, and sometimes even Chandelure. However, with the lower amount of Pokemon in the game, it's possibly that Dust Noir may finally find a place again. It will almost surely be on the lower end of the lower tiers, but it's not unrealistic, especially with Pursuit no longer being around. And while Dust Clops has been on the decline for a while, you should probably keep an eye out for it this VGC season. Because for the first time ever, Evil Light Dust Clops is included in a regional Pokedex, giving it an unprecedented opportunity to thrive in the 2020 Galarian decks metagame. With so few Pokemon making it across the pond, Dusclops has established itself as one of the premier trick room setters in the format, commonly supporting Pokemon such as Rhyperior, Torkoal, and Snorlax. Now, as of this video's release, it still faces some competition from Hatterene, who holds the boon of Magic Bounce to prevent any taunts, and from fellow Ghost-type Mimikyu, but Dusclops's bulk is still superior to both, providing ample opportunities to set trick room up multiple times in the match. And if you want an example of Dusclops in action, look no further than the absolute pinnacle of competitive play thus far. Wolf Glick's Pokemon Sword and Shield Super Smash Brothers Invitational, where underdog champion Ludwig Ogren used a Dusclops paired with a Butterfree as his lead almost every single game to make way for its Rhyperior and Torkoal to wreak havoc. Butterfree's redirection is just one more safety check to make sure Trick Room is going up. The plan, as they say, was simple. Aside from Ludwig, we can see first-hand evidence of Dusclops' power from an event just last weekend. The Bohum Regionals, where the German and Czech duo of Amre Sahan and David Kodish piloted their identical Dusclops based team to 4th and 5th place respectively. This team matched Dusclops with his usual partners of Torkoal and Rhyperior alongside Gothitelle's Shadow Tag to make the most of the archetype's big hits and Togekiss and Gyarados for speed control and follow me support. Dusclops has also had numerous appearances in the top 8 of the Galar Friendlies, the weekly tournament series run by VGC Stats. Legacy used it alongside a heavy hitting Haxorus to place top 8 at the Galar Friendly number 3, and 2 showed up in the top 8 of the Galar Weekly number 6, supporting their usual Rhyperior, though Lele Mosina also had an interesting pick in Vika Volt. And that's it! So how good were Dust Clops and Dust Noir actually? Well, for most of their careers, they've been beaten up on. They're both slow, weak, and passive, and their great defensive stats don't amount to much when they not only don't resist very much, but also have to work with their terrible HP stats. And it's been a lifetime of crippling mediocrity for the duo. However, in VGC, Dust Noir and then Eviolite Dust Clops have been able to use their bulk and excellent double support move pool to carve out a niche. They had to compete with the excellent Cresselia, but they were certainly far more successful than they were in singles, as they were actually worth being used in high-level matches. It's been incredibly rough for our ghostly duels so far, so here's to a better Generation 8. Dusclops' terrific showing in VGC thus far is a promising start. Thanks for watching, everyone, and as always, if you liked the video and you want to see more, be sure to subscribe to False Swipe Gaming for more weekly Pokemon content, and in the comments, I want to know what do you think about competitive Dusclops and Dust Noir? How would you buff them? Do you think they're find the way they are because they're kind of decent in vgc whatever it is let me know in the comments also thank you so much to our patrons for continued support of our videos and thank you to everyone else watching as well and follow my crew on these social media platforms and that's all i got see you next time everyone